Hello, my name is Karen, and today I'm going to talk about how to handle an overflowing ferment. Here we have a fabulous cabbage that's been going for about four days, but we're going to be, pretend like we're just in the first 72 hours. That way I can demonstrate to you how to go ahead and change off this airlock without opening the jar. In the first 72 hours, it's very important to leave your jar sealed no matter what because as the carbon dioxide gases are forming in here and pressing the oxygen out of the jar, the molds and the yeast are running out of oxygen to, to consume, and the lactic acid bacteria are really getting going and they're starting to thrive, and we don't want to interrupt that process. We certainly don't want to inter introduce any oxygen to give that mold and yeast a breath of fresh air and get them going again. So here we are. And uh, when she packed this jar, she had the cabbage just below the shoulder and the brine just a little bit higher than that. And you know, it's a living food. You just can't predict exactly how things are going to work out. And every now and then, the cabbage will continue to expand and it'll push the brine right up, through, fill the brine bowl to the top, and come right out the airlock and leave you a nice uh, visual situation like this. You do have another choice. You can just leave this alone. Put it on a plate let it run over. Um, I'm a little bit hesitant about that approach simply because that brine that's running into the into the plate, it really should stay in your jar. So if there's a way to interrupt this process, that would be my first choice, which and I'm about to show you that. But it, it's not the end of the world to just to just wait. And what you can do is without disrupting any of the seals on here, you can do just a little bit of this and try to get your gases to rise and your brine level to drop a little bit and increase that gap there of gases inside the jar. So then, so my first choice would be to go ahead and get this loose and work it up and have your finger ready to go. And as soon as I'm ready to pull that off of there, I'm going to plug that hole because I don't want to let any more molecules of oxygen into this jar than I absolutely have to. So I'm going to be ready and I'm going to flip like that. That worked out really well. I got that right off of there. So now my jar is still sealed. I let a little in, but not very much. Certainly not as much as if I open the jar. So I'm going to just go ahead and give it a little rattle, try to disrupt those gases, try to get them to come up and get the brine level to drop further, in the hopes that after I've put my clean airlock in there, that I won't have any more overflow until we're far enough down the road on this ferment that opening the jar is a little bit safer for my ferment and I can still expect to get a full year out of that cabbage in storage before before we need to you know eat it. I've, I've stored my cabbage up to 15 months before there wasn't anything else regarding cabbage of course we have other food in the house but you know what I mean that uh, we wanted to eat sauerkraut it was the last jar it was 15 months old and it was still just fabulous in fact the more it ages the better it got so I'd like to make a jar and hide it from my family and see how good it is in three or four years just for just for the sheer joy of it. But I'm going to go ahead and I have this airlock filled and ready to go and the tip is sitting in water so it's all lubricated and ready for me. And just as I pulled the other airlock out, I'm going to try to slip this one in fast as I can so I don't interrupt and introduce air and interrupt the process here. So here we go. That wasn't perfect, but it was pretty good. Certainly better than opening the jar. So there we go. So that, I'm just going to put the cover back on that and let it sit for a few more days. And if it continues to rise, you know, if it stays like that, I'm not going to mess with it uh, until maybe right before we go into cold storage. I might pound it down, but it's not absolutely necessary. Then uh, if you do put it in cold storage, you might be able to see here we've got one. It's been sitting in cold storage and miraculously, the brine level was very high in this jar. But when we put it into the cold storage, the brine level just dropped right down. So this would be a, a good candidate for opening the jar. I mean, this is a two month old ferment, you understand. Taking the brine bowl out, using the tart tamper and really working it down under the brine. But since this ferment is past the 72 hours and I wanna show you how that's done, I already have another lid and airlock all ready to go. And uh, so I can just take this one off and not worry about it again. I won't have to clean it up. Uh, I am going to want to have a, oh here we go, my paper towel. I want to have my paper towel handy so that I can wipe off anything off the rim of the jar and make sure that that's going to create a really good seal when I put the new lid back on. I don't want any cabbage bits that might be stuck between the jar and the lid that will flip out over the edge of the rim. And if you have one little piece like that, it can wreck your seal and then you'll, and then you'll potentially have a big problem. So I'm going to go ahead and open this up. 
I always like to hold my jar down firmly while I kind of pry loosely because sometimes they're really stuck on their good and, and I don't want to push and push and push and push and then have the whole thing fly. So that's kind of what I'm doing there. And then I'm going to pinch that off of the hinge. So I can just set that down over here. See, there's a little bit of, I don't know if you can see that, a little bit of pink stuff up under the lid. It really came up all the way to the top. Now then someplace in here, I've got a little tool right here, these little bamboo tongs. Reach in here, there, oh my brine bowl's right there, right where it should be. I'm gonna just dig that out of there. I don't wanna get my hands in there. Now I've washed my hands really good with soap, but I don't wanna get my hands in there at this point if I don't really need to. So I'm gonna set that down. Get my little tart tamper in there. Oh, you see that? I hope you can see that on the video. That's just remarkable to me. We're just gonna work that cabbage down there underneath that brine. Now the chances are very, very good that I'm only gonna need to do this once in the whole countertop phase. Maybe again after the cold, after it's into cold storage, but this will absolutely ensure that I don't have any more overflowing airlock during the countertop phase of this sauerkraut. Isn't that just a lovely white and, and purple cabbage combination my friend made? There's a lot of gas in that jar. It's just really, really, really rising a lot. Push down right in the middle. Boy, that's just amazing to me. It's fun, it smells so good. It's just got such a wonderful color and delicious flavor. Now I know that this is not a good point in the ferment to be tasting anything, so I wouldn't do that, especially with cabbage. Cabbage has some nutritional things going on in the jar that the this particular ferment, there's some things in there that the lactic acid bacteria kind of create on the front end of the ferment and then they take care of on the on the back end of the ferment and that's why you don't want to eat a cabbage ferment for three months. It needs three months to take care of all the histamines and other things in there that you don't want to eat that cause real problems for some people. So I'm sure I could work on this quite a lot longer but I've got an awful lot of that. I can still see bubbles at the edge. I could give it another two or three minutes, but I think that's really sufficient. Most of the cabbage is down about an inch below the brine. I can feel where it gets solid right there. And that's gonna be just fine. Now I'm gonna go ahead and put the brine bowl back in. Now under perfect circumstances, I would have planned better and I'd have a clean brine bowl, but this just came out clean. I put it on a clean plate. I'm just gonna put it right back in. Just like that, float it right back on top of there. So that if the ferment isn't done going crazy, that brine bowl is going to serve the purpose that it did in the first place and possibly collect a little bit of overflow before it overwhelms the ferment and comes right out of the lid again. So let's just see how that's going to work out. This is the clean one. I'm going to pinch that little back end there, stick it right there on the hinge. Oh, I forgot to check my rim, didn't I? Gotta check my rim, wipe that off, make sure that there's nothing there on the rim. Good and clean. There we go. And then lock that down. Now that is good to go. I'm going to put the cover back on it because it's very important that lactic acid bacteria be allowed to do their work in the dark. Light kills them. Mold and yeast don't seem to mind it so much, but lactic acid bacteria do not do well in the light. So then I'm going to make it pretty and I'm going to set it back over here where it can just continue to bubble away in nice in peace. And in another three or four days, we're going to move it to cold storage, and then we'll check on it again. And if it needs another press down before it does its long haul in the cold storage, we'll give it to it. Thanks so much for watching. I hope this really helps you move forward in very functional fermenting. Thank you.